When I think about chemical kinetics and reaction rates, the place I like to start is at the theory side of it. Um, now, a lot of people put that off to the end. Uh, I like to put it right up front because if we start talking about the theory, if we start talking about why these things happen, it's a little bit easier to put in context what's going on in all of the reactions we're looking at. So let's jump in and take a little bit of a look at um, the theory behind chemical kinetics and reaction rates, collision theory. All right, so let's assume that we've got some container and let's put a cap on it just to keep things in place. And let's say that I'm looking at the reaction of A plus B goes to you know, whatever you want. Let's just say C. Um, right now, we're really just concerned about the reactants. Um, so in my container, let's say I've got one particle of A and one particle of B. All right. In order for this reaction to occur, what has to happen? All right. In order for A and B to react to form C, what has to happen in this container? And that's really the basis of um, collision theory. So collision theory tells me that in order for A and B to react, in order for my A particle and my B particle to react with each other, well, what has to happen? First of all, they have to encounter each other. So collisions must occur. And you know, that one seems to make pretty good sense. If A and B never actually come in contact with each other, it's pretty hard for A and B to react to form C. So step one, collisions must occur. But there are some conditions on that. We can't just have any old random collision. So step two, collisions must be oriented. And what do we mean by oriented? Well, A and B are just round globs here, but what if A instead was something that was shaped a little bit more like that? And what if B was something that was shaped a little bit more like that. Well now, in order for A and B to react, they have to collide, they have to encounter each other, but they have to encounter each other such that, let me grab a different color here, such that this part of A and this part of B collide with each other, right? I tried to draw it so that those two fit together sort of like um, a lock and a key. So the collisions must be oriented. Finally, the collisions must be energetic. And by energetic, we mean that the collision has to occur with enough energy, with enough force, so that a reaction actually occurs. If we think about what's happening in a chemical reaction like this, the electron cloud of A and the electron cloud of B have to interact with each other, but electrons repel so if I just sort of casually bring A and B together, they might just repel each other. 
if I really throw A and B at each other, well, then those electron clouds will probably have to merge a little bit and blend a little bit, and then a chemical reaction could take place. So whenever we're thinking about chemical kinetics, whenever we're thinking about reactions, what we really want to do is think about why the reaction is occurring and think about collision theory in that, um, in that case. Collisions must occur, they must be energetic, and they must be oriented. Um, and as I say in the reading notes, these things all are probabilities, right? So there's some probability that a collision is going to occur. And of those collisions that occur, there's some percentage of them that are going to be correctly oriented. And of the ones that occur and are correctly oriented, there's some percentage that are going to be energetic enough to react. So in many ways, this is just a series of probabilities that we can look at um, to decide how to make a reaction occur faster or slower um, as we work through uh, the process of designing our experiment. So that's just a really quick little walkthrough of collision theory. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about other aspects of kinetics moving forward. Good luck.